Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. If this is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We cover many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former residents. If you missed any of our past presentations or would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box. And we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have a question or comment, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished researchers and professors within the Department of Pittsburgh, Department of University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Ed Dixon. As for that, Dr. Friedlander, please thank you and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Justin, and I'm uh, delighted again to uh, to be with you this week, as I usually do. Want to give a little update on the uh, happenings of the week, particularly as it pertains uh, to COVID, and then uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dixon. This uh, week, uh, things have been uh, fairly stable as it uh, pertains uh, to COVID. The numbers, uh, number of cases within our hospitals have uh, been around uh, 300. And this is uh, counting over 5,500 uh, beds uh, or so throughout uh, Western and Central uh, Pennsylvania. So the numbers have been uh, stable. Uh, they've gone from a high of 1,200 and a low of uh, about 100 uh, within the past several months. So again, it looks like uh, hopefully turning a corner. More and more people are getting vaccinated, particularly just about everybody or everybody that wants to be vaccinated in the hospital has received a vaccine. And hopefully we're starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Still going to be complicated with the variants that are uh, around. And But things are, 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 are uh, in my opinion, are looking a little bit uh, better uh, as we go. One of my goals of talking about this uh, every week is just to make sure that uh, uh, individuals that need to come into the hospital and need medical care not to hesitate to come to the hospital or to reach out uh, to us. We're doing uh, a lot of visits as a telemedicine visit so uh, people don't have to actually come to the hospital to be uh, fully uh, evaluated. Uh, these are for elective uh, uh, patients as uh, an example. Our hospitals are, are extremely safe. Everybody's temperature gets monitored. Everybody's uh, wearing a mask. Uh, they're extreme uh, uh, cleaning uh, measures that the hospital takes. And again, I feel very, very safe uh, uh, coming uh, here. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, the very, very few healthcare workers actually have uh, gotten uh, sick, particularly within our, our department. Uh, so uh, it's a safe place. It's more dangerous not to come to the hospital if you need to, and again, I urge anybody that needs uh, uh, care to contact us or contact your primary uh, care doctor. Uh, transitioning, uh, as you all know, uh, research to me, it's something that uh, I'm uh, again incredibly uh, uh, passionate about. I think it's a very, very important aspect of of neurosurgery, of medicine uh, in general. If general, if we don't uh, evolve and advance. Other people are going to do what we need to do. And uh, to me, this is really, really uh, important. And in our series, we've had a number of, uh, of uh, clinicians that talk, but also a number of uh, PhDs that are part of our department and an integral part of our department. Uh, research is uh, uh, you know, a key part of our, of our mission and what we do. And actually, as a matter of fact, uh, our department's got the largest number of uh, federally funded and neurosurgeons uh, in the country with uh, six neurosurgeons that have that. So research is really important. A lot of this is uh, uh, partnerships uh, that uh, we have uh, with uh, PhDs and Dr. Ed Dixon, who's uh, our vice chair for research, uh, provides me help and advice on, on a lot of uh, research uh, matters. Uh, uh, Dr. Dixon is an icon in uh, uh, in uh, the traumatic brain injury experimental uh, research. Uh, he developed uh, the fluid percussion model, which is used uh, from around uh, the world and uh, by many, many labs. And uh, you know, he's done some very, very important uh, research and currently working on uh, developing therapies for traumatic uh, brain uh, injury. So Dr. Dixon, uh, again, an integral part of uh, our uh, department, and uh, I'm delighted that he's able to join us today. So Ed, uh, please go ahead and take it away. 
OK, uh, thank you, Dr. Freelander. Uh, it's a pleasure to be this week's speaker on the Fridays with Freelander lecture series. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some of our work, you know, past and present. Uh, first, a few slides kind of defining the public health problem of traumatic brain injury. Uh, and then I want to talk about mechanisms of the neural communication deficits that occur after TBI, uh, specifically TBI and neurotransmission, uh, the release of neurotransmitters and their effects, uh, and the, the post presynaptic mechanisms and potential therapies, and, and lastly, post-traumatic, post-synaptic mechanisms and some targeted therapies. Um, sprinkled in throughout my talk will be some uh, translational slides in which we try to link some of the laboratory work with some of the, some of the clinical work, and that this little icon will come up when I get to those slides. So let's start off. Uh, so TBI, uh, uh, most of you know it's caused by a blow or a jolt to the head. Uh, it's uh, over 200, uh, excuse me, 2.5 million emergency room department ED visits uh, annual for TBI. Uh, of course, most of them, 87% are mild or are very mild concussive injuries in which they're treated and released from emergency departments. A, a smaller percentage, 11% are hospitalized. Uh, 283,000 estimated by the CDC. 2% uh, of those, 2% uh, of the patients um, die. Um, these numbers probably underestimate the occurrence, particularly of the mild concussive injuries, because many of these may be treated at their local doctors, clinics, um, uh, and not at hospitals. Some of the health effects of TBI, some of the persistent deficits that are observed include cognitive, such as attention and learning and memory, executive functioning, uh, certainly language and reaction time. Uh, these are things that uh, my lab has been focused on and tr trying to develop therapies for cognitive deficits. There's also um, a behavioral, emotional, uh, uh, patients can be aggressive, uh, disinhibited. Um, socially inappropriate. Uh, there's also a, probably a newer appreciation of sort of the motor deficits um, occurring after TBI, uh, experimentally including uh, uh, changes in balance and walking, sensory conditions, sensitivity to light, some vision and hearing, um, and somatic headache, such as headache, somatic and symptoms, headaches, sleep disturbances, chronic pain. Now these, these um, categories, of course, are not independent. You need good functioning and many of these for the others to be high functioning. For example, in cognition, you, if you're going to take a paper and pencil test, you need to have good vision, you have to have good motor control, and you must have the attention to perform the test. Uh, so it, obviously these things are not isolated. So TBI and neurotransmission deficits. So one of the first evidence that neurotransmission was impaired after TBI was several series of drugs that bind to neurotransmitter receptors have been shown to influence uh, functional outcomes. For example, this very early study we did was looking at the cholinergic system. And here we used a drug, a common drug, scopolamine. Scopolamine is a muscarinic antagonist uh, and given early after injury, uh, we, we saw that it attenuated motor deficits after uh, in a preclinical model. And this, these red hours, arrows are demonstrating that this was a dose response that the middle dose of one milligram per kilogram attenuated um, deficits in beam balance or beam walking function. And also actually their body weight was, we had less body weight after TBI, which suggests of, <clears throat> of improved general health in our animal, in our preclinical models. Looking at the dopaminergic system, we've looked at methylphenidate or Ritalin uh, and its effect on uh, preclinical uh, cognitive deficits. And in this one example, we show a memory test, which is Morse water maze. And this is the learning of the test. The animals over time get better. This is the, the uninjured group. Uh, the injured group do much poorer in this cognitive test and daily treatment with methylphenidate attenuated this cognitive deficit. Uh, and now, translational-wise, we 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 follow this up with a small clinical study, uh, and and in complicated mild to moderate TBI patients, in which after they recovered their post-traumatic amnesia, they they were uh, pre-tested on a battery of neuropsych tests. They were given 30 days of of, of methylphenidate, retested, and then retested 60 days later. And what we found on this really small study was that the methylphenidate groups had enhanced rate of recovery of uh, the disability rating score in test 
of, of diligence, um, suggesting that the things we're looking at preclinically may have some relevance uh, clinically and vice versa. Amantadine is another drug that's commonly used during rehabilitation and traumatic brain injury. It has effects that increase dopamine release uh, and can block NMDA receptors. Uh, we found and others have found that amantadine can attenuate cognitive deficits in preclinical models of TBI. Um, the, the, the literature is uh, is is a little bit of a, a moving target. Some people have found that higher doses are more effective than lower doses. Uh, so uh, this this is where this is uh, this single dose, which was I believe five milligrams or per kilogram a day, um, may may work for some models and not others. And uh, clinical translation is will be key. There's actually been a, a, a New England Journal of Medicine study looking at amantadine for severe TBI, in which they saw that they saw that amantadine accelerated the pace of functional recovery. Uh, during active treatments and, and post-traumatic disorders of consciousness. So this just as a, as a subset of some of the drugs targeting neurotransmitter systems that have been evaluated. Uh, this graph is just showing the percent improvement in a cognitive test of Morris water maze for each of these drugs. The point of this showing this is that, you know, there's a number of therapies that target neurotransmitter receptors that can improve cognitive outcomes and both preclinically and clinically. Uh, so the question next is, does TBI alter the neurotransmitter receptors and or their synthesis proteins after TBI? Why, why do these drugs work? Um, this is one back to the cholinergic system. This is a study we did looking at the uh, cetacholine uh, muscarinic 2 subtype receptor um, at one day through four weeks after injury, and we found uh, decreases, pre decreased, uh, decreased expression of the M2 protein uh, after injury, and this is in the hippocampus. Um, surprisingly, we saw that this decrease was sustained for up to one year after injury. So, you know, showing that these these protein changes can really persist and maybe may may contribute to long term uh, cognitive deficits. Looking at the dopaminergic system, we looked at a f we've looked at several things, but today I'm going to show uh, responses to the dopamine transporter, which is involved with the uptake of dopamine after release, and also the D2 type 2 receptor, which is involved uh, in modulating release, acting as an autoreceptor. Uh, we've seen uh, for the for the dopamine transporter protein, we've seen decreases at seven days. This is a green bar. This is the uh, the uh, hip, hippocampal, excuse me, frontal cortex, uh, ipsilateral to injury at one week and 28 days after injury. Uh, the dopamine D2 receptor is also decreased at two, excuse me, at, at one month after injury. So. Neurotransmitter targeted drugs have some benefit. The proteins involved with the synthesis and under release of, of uh, and, and binding of these proteins seem to be altered after TBI. So the question is, um, so are these changes sufficient to cause neurotransmitter release deficits? Now again, uh, so we used the technique of microdialysis, uh, which is a sampling technique in which this probe is implanted in the tissue of interest. Um, an artificial CSF fluid is pumped through it, and by osmosis, um, uh, free proteins of interest are transported into the probe, and we take these and can, and can measure them. So the cholinergic system, uh, we've looked at acetylcholine release and specifically evoked release, and we use scopolamine to evoke it. Now, scopolamine can increase release by blocking the autoreceptor, the, uh, and it, it, in, in uninjured groups, it has a pretty, pretty large increase in acetylcholine. Injured animals have a much more muted increase in acetylcholine, so it's, uh, this is uh, evidence that release of, of acetylcholine and neocortex is affected by TBI. Similarly, in the hippocampus, uh, we, we also see uh, decreases in invoked release of acetylcholine. We've also seen this in, in, the, in the dopamine system. Dopamine system. This is a study in which we saw a decreased uh, dopamine evoked release, and, and this time it was evoked by mixing a little potassium into the fluid through the, through the microdialysis probe for a short time. This nonspecific specifically causes depolarization, and we, we, can, we have observed decreased release of, of dopamine in, when measured in the striatum uh, at one week after TBI. 
Uh, similarly, using a, a completely different technique, work in Amy Wagner's lab has shown decreased evoked dopamine release in estradiol when it's evoked electrically by stimulating the medial forebrain bundle and measuring it using fast scan voltometry, a, a, a different technique than microdialysis. So, uh, up to, so what we've seen is that different neurotransmitters are, uh, th there's an impairment in release of several different transmitters. We've dopamine and acetylcholine. We've also looked at glutamate. Um, others have looked at adenosine. We, there's also deficits in neurotransmitter release in different regions in the cortex, hippocampus, stratum, and with different evoking stimuli, electrical, uh, uh, potassium, or uh, autoreceptor blockade. Regardless of these conditions, we see the same thing. We see a decrease in invoked release uh, of, of neurotransmitters. So the question arises, is there a common mechanism? What, what do these things have in common? And where do we start to approach this problem? So the, the next step is to look, we know release is down, but what about the machinery involved with vesicle docking and, docking and release of neurotransmitters? So, so we're kind of working the problem backwards. So uh, again, we're, we're looking at, uh, is there something wrong with the machinery involved with the tra trafficking and fusion and release of neurotransmitters after traumatic brain injury? So we, we started to look at the soluble in ethylmalamide sensitive fusion attachment protein receptor or SNARE as I'll call it from now on. Uh, these proteins are involved with the trafficking and docking of, of, of vesicles. Uh, particularly um, the, uh, upon the receiving a calcium stimulation, they undergo um, uh, some they undergo uh, structural changes uh, and they're and they 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 help dock snare. It's a nice name. Uh, the vesicles to the presynaptic membrane for fusion and release. And some of the proteins we're going to look, we've looked at is SNAP25, syntaxin, VAMP2, cysteine string protein alpha and alpha synuclein. Um, so the question is, does TBI affect the molecular machinery involved with the secular release? Is that a potential cause for these deficits in neurotransmission that we've observed? So how do you look at the protein complexes? So, so to, for their actions to occur, these SNARE proteins have to form complexes. So to look at complexes, we compare boiled tissue, which denatures it, to unboiled samples, which keeps the complex intact. We run them through a, a Western blot gel, though the complexes have higher molecular weight and don't move as far down the drill as the mono, monomeric denatured protein. And by that means we can kind of compare the two. So looking at the monomer the, uh, levels, the denatured protein of uh, this, is, we're just going to show a couple examples a day of SNAP25 and syntaxin. This is six hours through four weeks after injury. With some SNAP25, there's a little bit of an increase at one week and a decrease at two weeks. Overall, not a lot of change, Absol very little or no change in syntaxin monomeric levels across the same time points. However, in complexes, we do see more substantial uh, decrements in the, the, the complex forms of these proteins, particularly here we see one week and two weeks, uh, and also the same thing in, in syntaxin. Uh, we also see decreases in the complexes. Now, again, uh, clinical translation alert. There's we looked at some um, clinical samples that we have obtained from the, the Brain Trauma Research Center. Uh, these are uh, cortical samples. Um, from lobectomies for, uh, to control for our intra, uh, control for uh, intracranial pressure, and this normally discarded tissue is saved, and we we were able to get some TBI samples and compare them to controls from the Alzheimer's bank, and we do see you know the, the presence of complexes in the controls that are absent in the TBI tissue. Now, there's a normal caveats with this type of, of analysis, uh, but what but it's important for us to know that if, if the direction of changes we're seeing in our preclinical models does it mimic what could be happening in humans? Is, is there some, is, is it clinically relevant? So what about the, you know, if the synapses are, excuse me, if vesicles are not being uh, tra trafficked to the presynaptic membrane, is there something we can see morphologically uh, after TBI? So we did it, uh, particularly, uh, is, is there a change in the trafficking from the recycling pool to the readily releasable pool of vesicles if these snare proteins are dysfunctional in some way. So we did an, uh, a transmission electron microscopy study uh, in which we, in, in, in animals at one week after injury, the time point that we knew we had good snare deficits, we, we 
we dissected out a cubic millimeter of tissue and prepared it for uh, electron microscopy. Uh, for each animal, we randomly selected 20 synapses uh, and quantified vesicle properties. Properties, Particularly, we looked at the number of vesicles, uh, the active zone length. This is the active zone, this hyperdense region. Uh, we, within 450 nanometers of the active zone, we counted vesicles and we looked at their distribution. That is, we measured the shortest distance between each vesicle and the active zone. So what we found was uh, generally an overall decrease in the number of vesicles within this 450 meter uh, limit. Uh, and interestingly, um, the closer you got to the active zone, this, this is 50 millimeter um, distances from the active zone, we see greater decreases, differences in the number of vesicles uh, the close, you know, greater the greater deficits you saw, the closer you got to the to the active zone. So it's it's a finding that's at least consistent with some of the SNR data uh, protein responses we've seen. So uh, does TBI alter the proteins that are involved in the SNR complex assembly? And we looked at a couple of key proteins. One is the cysteine string protein alpha. It's an scaffold scaffold protein necessary for a SNR complex assembly. If you knock it out, the uh, the, 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 the SNR proteins have a hard time forming complexes. Uh, we've also looked at alpha synuclein, which I'll talk about more. Uh, it's 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 typically associated with Parkinson's disease in its oligomerized or aggregated state. Uh, in which those states it's quite toxic, but its normal function uh, is is believed to be involved with the with the with these formation of snare complexes. Cysteine string protein is decreased after injury. Uh, uh, at one day and one week, we, we, we observe both Western blot and with immunohistochemistry. It's, the differences are even more apparent when you look at uh, synaptosomal fractions. So if you concentrate the synapses and in, in the crude synaptic pellets, we can see a pretty dramatic differences in, in uh, cysteine string protein. Uh, this is at the same time point. Again, a clinical alert. Uh, so we, in some of these clinical uh, TBI cortical samples, we do see a hint of decreased levels or abundance of CSP alpha uh, compared to uh, the controls, suggesting that, again, some, some parallelism between the preclinical work and the clinical observations. So the next question is, is this, uh, is this TDP alter alpha synuclein? So as I mentioned, it's a protein associated with Parkinson's. Uh, and its post-translational post modifications, it can be extremely toxic, a constituent of Lewy bodies, uh, but its normal role, as this suggested by this science paper, is that it may assist in snare complex formation through its interaction through another protein, VAMP2. Uh, so the, the question involved is, this, is TBA alter normal wild-type alpha-synuclein protein? And uh, we, we, this paper is uh, in an EPUB now, uh, by by my, my associate Sean Carlson and of our group, showing that from six hours to eight weeks in the ipsilateral hippocampus, there's uh, significant reductions in, in monomeric alpha synuclein abundance. Um, no, no, no dramatic differences in the contralateral hippocampus, that is the side of the brain opposite that was injured. So are these, how you, is this, a, is CSP alpha a therapeutic target? You know, can we, re so we have these changes, uh, can we target some of these proteins involved with the uh, complexing of SNARE proteins to, uh, to enhance their function? So we found in this literature showing that lithium can enhance the expression of CSP, of uh, cysteine string protein after injury. Uh, so we, we this begged the question is, can, is lithium a, a reasonable treatment to look at SNARE protein dysfunction? Now, lithium, it's, it's, it's obviously an old drug, you know, uh, it's clinically used for mania and other in depression in humans. Uh, and in, as a, a neuroprotectant, it's been evaluated in pretreatment models of TBI um, and shown to attenuate uh, axonal injury, inflammation, a number of, of commonly used, commonly measured outcomes. Uh, and its effect is, is traditionally uh, believed to, to be its involvement in the role of glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, uh, by which it can mediate all these, um, uh, it can mediate all these um, beneficial positive growth factors, cell survival, neurogenesis, 
Uh, so that this is the this is the most common mechanism by people believe that lithium is acting. So our question was, can lithium attenuate the loss of snare complexes after TBI? Uh, and so this is a, a paper we published, and it showed initially showed that lithium can attenuate cognitive performance in our preclinical models. So this 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 is uh, learning the water maze test, uh, and the animals who did lithium can perform better than animals who did not get lithium. Uh, and looking at snare proteins, VAMP2 and alpha synuclein, particularly at this one week time point, this, this bar here is the animals give the injured uh, group given uh, control, and this is this, these light bars are the injured groups given lithium. And we see at seven days and 14 days that lithium treatment attenuated the loss of these snare proteins. Um, in both uh, VAMP2 and in a slightly different time course at one day, at three days and seven days, we see attenuation of, of wild type alpha synuclein monomers. Does this have any functional consequence? Going back to microdialysis, we did see that uh, lithium did enhance um, the levels of evoked dopamine release after TBI. And this, this blue line are the lithium treated animals versus the red line, which is the the uh, vehicle treated animals showing that it's still it's it's partially attenuated uh, by lithium at one week after injury. So now I want to switch gears and talk about uh, talk about a few studies with post post synaptic changes. The first is DARP32. DARP32 uh, stands for dopamine and cyclidin P regulated phosphoprotein with an apparent uh, molecular weight of 32,000. This is a protein that's been characterized by Nobel laureate Paul Greengard as a particular as a molecular switch for the reward pathway plasticity. Uh, in his case, he was looking at it for drug addiction. Uh, so DARP32 could play a, a critical role in the cellular of function and, and plasticity as, as noted by electrophysiological studies uh, and, and other and other dopamine related studies. So DARP32, this, this big protein lane in the middle of this diagram, has a number of phosphorylation, phosphorylation sites. Uh, and we're, we've been focusing on the uh, uh, protein phosphatase 2B. Uh, and it, and it's act, it's, this is phosphorylated by PKA. Uh, and it acts as a kind of a, a regulatory pathway that kind of opposes the MEK to the ERK pathway. So, um, so drugs that dephosphorylate it um, uh, can can have negative effects or po or positive effects via this negative this kind of double negative pathway here through protein phosphatase one. So, what's activating PKA? Can, but the question is, can we drive this? Uh, let me get to that in a second. So after injury, what we looked at the effects on the total protein levels, and we saw really nothing. This is an estriatum at a time course of six hours to four weeks, and really no changes in the abundance of the total protein of DARP32. However, the phosphorylated form at the T32 site, we do see substantial decreases in phosphor phosphorization uh, that can persist up to four weeks after injury. So uh, the question is, can, can we treat this in some way and, and will it have some benefit effects? So circling back to amantadine, one of our dopamine agonists, the, the goal was, see, can we stimulate uh, D1 receptors to help drive this positive side of the equation and ultimately get to more positive uh, proteins involved with classic learning and memory pathways? And we did actually did see that. So this is looking at uh, the effects of amantadine on stridal phosphate DARP32 at the theranine 34 site. And this is uh, plotting percent change relative to the sham vehicle group. This is uh, actually six hours after injury. And this far bar is the animals treated with vehicle or saline, uh, showing substantial decrease in, the, the, in phosphodark. And animals treated with amantadine had this uh, large, largely attenuated, um, suggesting another positive mechanism of which, of which amantadine may be working. So let me talk a second about some biomarkers of TBI and how this led to our, our second post postsynaptic uh, protein that we're looking at. When I think of biomarkers, I think of this reminds me of looking at the oil spots that are underneath my car and trying to figure out what's wrong with my car. And if you look at it closely, you can actually get an idea of whether you have transmission problems or engine oil, coolant. So 
uh, so you have these these things leaking out of your car. Biomarkers are things that are that are leaking out or being transported, actively transported out of the brain, ultimately getting to the bloodstream. So by measuring proteins in the bloodstream, we can get hints about what some of the pathology is in the brain. So I had a quest to figure out what's a good biomarker for synaptic damage. Uh, and what I found was neurogranin. Neurogranin, it's, it's a calcium calmodulin binding protein. It's ex, ex, expressed in dendritic spines. It's involved with PKC signaling. Uh, and it's uh, the main uh, protein regulating the, the availability of calmodulin, uh, binding it to the absence of calcium. So when calcium uh, enters, uh, uh, neuromod uh, neurogranin uh, uncouples for calmodulin and it can go on and do its stuff. So there's, there's an interesting, this, so my interest was derived from this work in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they they looked at CSF neurogranin. It's also been seen in serum in that the peripheral levels of neurogranin are increased in Alzheimer's patients. Uh, this is control. This is Alzheimer's patients, um, and they were they they attributed this to dendritic degeneration in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's actually been some traumatic brain injury clinical work uh, in which they've seen an, an increases in in serum levels of neurogranin early after uh, after injury. Um, so our question was: Is there, are we do we see neurogranin changes in these in this way in our preclinical model? And we that and we do see that we actually see that um, we have that, that neurogranin is, is is higher, actually higher in the injured than the shan. So what this graph is actually showing is actually a potential relationship between cognitive function and serum neurogranin levels. So this graph is plotting the, the uh, Morse water maze performance on the, after five days of training, and this is uh, serum neurogranin concentration, so that the better you are at performing this cognitive test, the lower is your serum levels of neurogranin, and there's a, a, a correlation between the two. So that it indicates that the poor cognitive performance is associated with greater concentration of circulating neurogranin at two weeks after injury, very, very reminiscent of the Alzheimer's clinical papers. So is neurogranin, is it just a passive biomarker for synaptic degeneration, something that's you're losing synapses and it just degrades and just passively gets transported into the, 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 the bloodstream? Or is it to have some mechanistically important function uh, that we can examine and potentially target for treatment? Um, so uh, a graduate student in my lab, Sarah Saversky, has recently published a paper that just looked at neurocranin protein expression after after uh, injury in our preclinical models, and we see that uh, in the ipsilateral cortex and also in the ipsilateral uh, uh, hippocampus, there are decreases at one weeks and two weeks. Now in this study, we didn't see it at four weeks. Uh, subsequent studies, we've seen uh, some. Some, some suggestion of decreases at four weeks, and this is supported by some pilot work showing that tissue level expression is actually sustainably decreased at three months after injury uh, in our in our preclinical model. And this is uh, this is in the uh, hippocampus. So to summarize, uh, we we found that TBI can produce a broad range of alterations in neurotransmitter systems and that neurotransmitter receptor targeted therapies can improve uh, preclinical cognitive function. Um, the synaptic vesicle density and distribution are altered after TBI uh, and TBI can alter the, the machinery, the, the medical machinery involved with the trafficking and docking of these vesicles. Uh, the, re the reduction of snare proteins occur at time, po <clears throat> occur at time points of established impairments of neurotransmitter release and cognitive deficits, but uh, it, it's too premature to, to uh, determine a cause ca ca causal relationship between these changes at this point. It's something we're working towards. Uh, daily treatment with lithium restored, uh, excuse me, restored its near complex formation and dopamine release after TBI. And the, the beneficial effects of mantidine may involve uh, DARP32. Uh, and lastly, neurogranin is reduced after TBI in the tissue and increased in blood. So future directions are to uh, examine strategies to restore neurogranin. If, if neurogranin has a causative effect on some of its downstream pathways involved with learning and memory, uh, does uh, promoting it 
in, uh, attenuate some of these deficits. So we're, we're currently um, using some adeno-associated virus technology to increase the expression, the gene expression and protein expression of neurogranin. We're also uh, undertaking some pharmacological strategies to increase the expression of neurogranin. Uh, we're also, um, now the deficits in neurotransmission may be due to obviously a number of things. So we're, going, we're also going to look at white matter connectivity of dopamine and acetylcholine circuitry using MR tractography. And just a little teaser, some preliminary data we have seen uh, in our animal model, some decreases in fiber density and the injured versus the uninjured animals in the striatum and the substantia nigra uh, in, in these regions. Uh, in the cholinergic system, we, we're, we're, we're looking at the uh, septum, the diagonal band, we have these regions isolated and we're looking at the connectivity between that and known cholinergic targets such as the hippocampus uh, and, and other regions. So at, at that, uh, I, will, I will end. Um, we to thank all the people who've helped in these studies uh, over the years and the agencies and foundations that have supported this work or has been absolutely critical and um, happy to take questions at this point. Thanks so much, Dr. Dixon. Uh, what an incredible presentation. Uh, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. We will try to answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Dr. Friedlander, would you like to uh, begin with a comment before we start? Sure, Dr. Dixon, thank you for the presentation. Lots of uh, work over, over a uh, very extended uh, period of time and amazing uh, track record. Um, I, have a, I have two questions for you. Some of the things that you and I have spoken um, about, can you uh, discuss a little bit of uh, approaches that you're taking or other people are taking at evaluating candidates for human uh, clinical trials? How do you think about it and how are you going about it? And then related uh, to that, uh, where do you see, you know, both acute and chronic therapy for traumatic uh, brain injury being in the next uh, decade or so? I don't know if I can answer that, but I'll take a crack at it. Uh, I think that clinically, uh, if creating a, a pipeline for clinically relevant, drug, relevant drugs is, is critical. And of course, the low hanging fruit, fruit is the currently FDA approved compounds and repurposing them for, you know, like we've done with lithium and all these other drugs. Uh, and to, after demonstrating some effect, perhaps, perhaps perform some more cl uh, cl clinical manipulations or cl chemical ma manipulations to find more specific drugs. Uh, I think, I mean, there, there's screening the effects of drugs on, um, uh, all, you know, genomic databases and proteomic databases, um, and also using some of the um, in silico chemistry to to find um, uh, potential therapies and tapping into the NIH um, uh, database of uh, FDA approved compounds, whether or not they've been used in brain or not, is a strategy that that's, that's, has borne some fruit with others. Um, you know, uh, another way to move it down the pipeline is to do this in uh, consortiums. And as you know, the, the consortium we worked on here with Pat Kahanek, the Operation of Brain Trauma Therapy, in which the same drugs and doses were tested in multiple preclinical models, with the goal being that, you know, drugs that affect a range of, of models are likely to translate more. Um, of course, you know, clinical TBI is, is heterogeneous. It's, it's key to pick the model that recreates the aspect of human TBI that you want to use. And, and I think efforts are being made for common data elements for preclinical data that I'll think that I think will uh, help in the long run to 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 move therapies along. Um, in terms of um, therapies for acute versus chronic, uh, I mean, acute is 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 always have been kind of anti-excited toxic approaches, trying to turn off the surge, the excited to ex excitation that occurs at injury. Um, there, there's I'm sure there's subacute things. I mean, classically, you know, you know, uh, moderate hypothermia uh, attenuates uh, glutamate surges. Um, but I, you know, I think some of the, you know, we've had discussions with, uh, you know, with some of the rehab, rehab experts is some of the chronic therapies, like some of these, you know, these agonists, these like methylphenidate or amantadine is the question is how soon can you start them? Uh, can you start them in the ICU? You know, these are questions that we probably need to sort out better in the, in the laboratory. 
um, certainly more chronic therapies, uh, you know, enhancing ner uh, endogenous neurogenesis, uh, preventing uh, chronic um, uh, insults such as, uh, as post-traumatic seizures, um, and, and certainly, you know, uh, some of these pharm pharmacological approaches to try to restore normal function, um, e either stem cells that express certain proteins or other genetic modifications. Um, I mean, certainly um, AAVs are being, are, have been used in humans, um, so perhaps some gene therapy strategies in the future could be used. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Is your research multidisciplinary? Oh, absolutely. Uh, even it, just purely laboratory, it's impossible for a single lab to have all the techniques to try to answer your questions. For example, the, the newer imaging studies we, we're trying to do, we're working with, uh, you know, radiologists uh, and neuroscientists to, to, to look at the white matter changes. Uh, we're interested, we're collaborating with people to look at e electrophysiology. Um, if you want to look at uh, the link between behavior and these, some of these proteins you're measuring, you need something, something like electrophysiology to look at a little more molecular synaptic plasticity changes. Um, I, I would say, I mean, trauma, there are scientists who have their expertise and they apply it to different fields. Uh, so, you know, this is a case where, um, you know, this is TBI and we pull the, the expertise we need to answer our questions. So it, it, it could be, you know, for example, this new AAV stuff we're doing, we, we're collaborating with folks uh, right now, like George Geddes in pediatric surgery to help generate the constructs um, for that. Uh, so it, there's definitely, it's, it's very multidisciplinary. Excellent, thank you. Uh, how does a patient's age factor into how TBI is treated? Uh, well, different ages respond differently to TBI too. If you look at the, you know, pediatric patients and, and aged patients uh, tend to do worse after injury, uh, or at least the incidence is higher in, the, in, these, in these age groups. Um, I think it's, it's essential for not only to look at these treatments for different age ranges, um, you know, an, an older, an older uh, person may have a different synaptic profile and the therapies may may act differently uh, and conversely a, a pediatric patient in which you have a, an aggressive innervation occurring in the developing brain may respond differently so I, I think age is, is is very important also gender I mean it's essential I mean we're 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 mandated by NIH to include gender as a variable but it's you know we do it it's interesting not just because it's mandated but there are some very interesting uh, gender differences we've seen differences in synaptic plasticity based on gender uh, after TBI uh, in our lab so thank you. How how has how we view TBI changed over your career? Oh, hugely. I mean, there's so much public recognition of the of the health problem now, particularly uh, concussion. The concussion work has just taken off, and it's it's there's a lot more public awareness of TBI. Um, the, I mean. It, TBI, and it was a much smaller field when I started out. There was just a handful of NIH-funded centers really doing the work. Right now, there are thousands of people probably doing TBI work and really good work. So I would say the growth, the, the biggest change is the growth of the field and how many more people are involved. So it's a re it's really an exciting time in the field. Excellent. Um, are there any are there unique aspects to studying TBI in veterans? Well, it. It depends on the source of the TBI. First, yes, they're they're a population that's more fit uh, than than probably the general population. Uh, if they're having um, TBI symptoms in response to exposures to blasts, that may be uh, completely different than uh, a mechanical, a, a straight impact TBI. Uh, and and you know there are some preclinical models to try to simulate that and to see if the therapies. Uh, are, 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 can also be applied there. There's also the exposure to um, during training to blast to to not blast, but just you know 
repeatedly firing a, a grenade launcher or practicing to how to uh, breach a doorway. These can, these these are uh, these small exposures are almost like subconcussive impacts in which they could summate to produce some persistent symptoms. So. Uh, and so I think uh, the, the mechanism of injury differs. Um, I don't know if yet if the treatment will differ. Very good, thank you. Uh, do you think artificial intelligence will play a role in the future of TBI in the future? Yeah, I think on many fronts. I mean, one of the issues is we have we have all this data and how do you make sense of it? I mean, how do you how do you aggregate data from many different labs or clinics to look at a larger picture? And there are some groups that are using machine language to try to make sense of these large data sets to look for trends that, that an individual lab doesn't have the power and sensitivity to detect. Uh, the, uh, I think the machine learning can also be valuable in, in pattern analysis for for electrophysiology, for looking at trends and outcomes. I think it's really untapped and I think it's uh, this, this there's a lot of new interest in machine learning learning in TBI. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Um, how does brain injury raise a person's risk for having a stroke? Um, I don't know if it uh, if you're if you're having a chronic inflammatory response from a brain injury that may make you render you more vulnerable to a stroke if you're having uh, changes in your vasculature. Um, you, if you have any systemic changes like changes in, in blood pressure that, that could influence stroke. But um, I, it, I think you know they're both insults, whether one comes first or the other, that the second one's going to be worse. Um, than it would be if you didn't have the first insult. But um, I don't, I, I think that's, I think they're, they're I, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I, I'm, uh, I would guess it would do with systemic factors. Very good, thank you. Uh, what has you most hopeful and excited about in the, in the future for TBI research? Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot, newer tools coming online that say are currently being used in the in the cancer fields that in terms of understanding the molecular changes after TBI and we're, we're translating we applying these newer technologies uh, of drug discovery um, to the field of TBI I think is really exciting um, and I, I think you know the biomarker effort is just being tapped I mean there's so much to learn with that. I mean, probably, you know, maybe a few dozen biomarkers have been looked at, uh, but I think, you know, this, it really needs to be screened. There's, it's, I think there's, it's an exciting way of looking, you know, to, it's an exciting window into the brain and how it responds to injury. So I'm looking forward to not only developing uh, new biomarkers, but I think, you know, the, the um, getting it to market is going to be key. Getting it FDA approved is going to be key. So, I mean, that's the, the, again, that, that aspect of the field is, is really just beginning. Very good. Thank you. Uh, what do you wish others knew about the field of TBI research? Um, I would say that if it's it's not a dirty a field as some people think in the sense that when the grants are reviewed or paper reviewed and you're comparing TBI to a stroke grant or to an, a, a neurodegenerative crack, a neurodegenerative grant, sometimes TBI is viewed as well. It's 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 dirty or you know the classic phrase from John Jane is it's it's the brain's a squash bug and you can't do anything about it. I think I think with something I would like people to learn is that there is a great deal of hope. Um, in the treatment of TBI, and uh, I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Very good, thank you. Um, I'm a medical student interested in TBI brain research. What made you go into the field? Um, I was, you know, as, as most things in life, it's somewhat, um, uh, somewhat accidental, but I was always interested in, in, in learning and memory. Um, and I had an opportunity to, as a grad student, to choose two areas. Uh, one was pain and one was uh, TBI, and I chose TBI, and I've been doing it ever since I was a second year grad student. Um, and what, what sustains me in it, it's just, it's just a fascinating field. 
um, that as, as someone who's interested in learning memory, it's, an, uh, it's a great field to study mechanisms of learning and memory in a very clinically uh, relevant, uh, you know, and, and also it's, I, I was always, I did my, my graduate research in a neurosurgery laboratory. So I've always been in this translational position where the work we do in the lab um, is viewed through the eyes of clinical translation. So for me personally, I, I like being uh, in, a, in a translational style of position. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Dixon. So we have time for uh, one more question. I think it's a good one to end on. Uh, what makes Pitt's TBI research among the best in the world? I think Pitt, I mean, it's, it's Pitt, not just neurosurgery, but it's, it's distributed across a normal, uh, a range of departments, critical care, pediatric critical care, uh, phys uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, uh, tissue engineering, uh, and, and mechanical engineering, uh, and, and many in, in pharmacy. So it's, I think we've had one thing at Pitt, it's, it's, all, it's been viewed as a strong center for TBI, is because we have a lot of people in a lot of departments interested in the problem. We have a great clinical problem, uh, clinical program uh, led by David Oconco. We, you know, these, these uh, uh, you know, he's involved in all the major clinical trials. Uh, so we have the, the latest, greatest clinical care for patients here. Uh, and it's so it, it's and we, you know, we learn things from in a lab. We learn things from how clinical patients are are managed, too. So I think, you know, Pitt has probably the most number of people, I would say, studying TBI research. When you, if you total up all the departments and all the people and maybe all the funding, I'd be worth looking at. Uh, it, it's really uh, uh, one of the, the, the set, national centers for TBI research. Excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Dixon. Uh, again, what an incredible presentation. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees today. Again, if you have any questions or would like to more, learn more about ways to support the Department of Neurosurgery, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. Uh, we're so happy to be able to stay connected this way with all of our Department of Neurosurgery friends. Uh, Dr. Freeland, would you like to uh, send us off for the day? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Justin, and uh, Ed, really uh, phenomenal uh, talk and what you've done for uh, TBI research and patients is, uh, is amazing and I really look forward for what's uh, to come. I agree with you that we have a really uh, world-class, uh, powerful TBI research team, both on the clinical side and the uh, basic science uh, component. So really uh, very proud of everything that's uh, that's been done and look forward uh, to the future. Uh, coming up, uh, we're going to take a couple of weeks uh, off and Dr. Dade uh, Lunsford uh, will be speaking on training uh, for GAN and I. So I look forward to seeing you all uh, then and have a safe and happy uh, weekend. Take care.